Hello, Internet, and welcome to another episode of Experimental Cataclysm, the show where we talk about recent changes to the experimental version of Cataclysm Dark Days Ahead. Now, this video is already late, and I know that because I'm just now recording the audio on Friday, which is the day it normally goes up, and I'll talk about why this was late at the end of the video and why that may extend to future videos as well. It could be some issues moving forward, but we'll get to that at the end of the show. Uh, I know most of you just want the video, so let's get into it. There are actually aren't very many changes at all to discuss this time around, which is super helpful with my schedule, but probably disappointing to most of you. With that though, let's just jump into the video. First up today from Mail Clips, we have a change to NPC shooting. Now there's very little explained in the summary of the PR, and it looks like the only change was one line of code, so there isn't actually much to talk about here. However, based on what I saw, it looks like this made it so that NPCs will shoot more frequently. Apparently previously, NPCs would become sort of uh, stunlocked and not really know what to do, which would lead to them moving towards melee when they actually should have used their firearm. Now, according to this PR, they should be using their guns more frequently. My expectation is that this will make bandits and similar hostile NPCs a lot more dangerous since many of them spawn with guns. In the past, having them close and try to melee you was a lot easier to deal with, obviously, than a barrage of gunfire. Guns in this game are still a great way to completely lose a run in a single turn, so you know, there's always the fear around that sort of thing. However, it does make sense, obviously, for NPCs to use the guns that they have on their person. I would recommend you be way more wary of gun-toting NPCs as of Monday when this change went into effect. Next up today from Bark, we've got, uh, ugh, we have grits. If you're not familiar, grits are just cornmeal and water, and it's a like a staple food in the American South. Basically, it's just oatmeal, but instead of delicious oats, you instead have a gritty sludge that gets stuck in your teeth. I associate two things with the southern United States, which is racism and xenoph- I mean grits and sweet tea. If you go to a restaurant, the first question is, y'all want some sweet tea? And if you go in the morning, it's, how do y'all want your grits? Now, I find both of these things to be pretty disgusting, and now we have both of them in Cataclysm. They're actually a really common food. Actually, do we have sweet tea? I, I might- it's just tea, I guess, that we would make. We don't really use sugar in most recipes anyway. But anyway, grits are actually like a really common food item. Again, especially in the South, so they probably should be in the game. Anyway, these are really easy. You can now make them with cornmeal and water with the option of adding cheese for more calories. So hooray, there's a taste of Southern cooking if it can even be called cooking. Next up, very simple change from White Cloud 0123, which was uh, to prevent mounted animals from reacting to hallucinations. I really only mention this because it's hilarious to me that my horse might have been spooked by me having a hallucination of my mother. In reality, this probably was pretty frustrating for people who used mounts, since a spooked mount could throw the player off of their back. Now, it's ultimately a very simple change, though that's pretty niche and probably won't affect most players, since I think mounts are still pretty underutilized in general. Next up today from Fairy Armadillo, we've got molting for mutants with various carapace or exoskeleton or whatever you would call it type mutations. Now the idea here is that animals like crabs frequently go through the molting process, which is where they shed their hard exteriors and just like grow a brand new carapace or whatever you would call it. During that time, their exterior becomes soft and much more vulnerable. And for those of you who are seafood eaters, this is the difference between a soft shell crab and just regular crab. Anyway, this PR makes it so that mutants with the chitin carapace, the scleroton plate, or the... is it epicutical, I guess, mutation? Anyway, mutants with those mutations will now need to periodically mold. Now the process goes like this, you have whichever exoskeleton or carapace mutation that you have, and you start getting warnings in the log explaining that you feel like you're soon going to need to molt and you should get to a safe place. Now this is a debuff that you can see in the character menu and it will start about 24 hours prior to the molting process. And the debuff of course has a description that lets you know you're going to molt. And then right after you molt, you will be given a more severe debuff. At that point, you will literally be fully immobilized for a period of time that will vary depending on which mutation you have. 
Low tier mutations will have you immobilized for about five minutes, but the uh, like the highest tier is about 15 minutes of immobilization. And during that time, you will receive messages explaining that you're shedding your exterior carapace and you're molting. When this period of time is over, you are freshly molted, meaning your carapace mutation will now provide lower protection values. These have their own versions of the mutation, which will explain that you've recently molted. Now, these provide lower protection values than their hardened versions, but they also have lower encumbrance to show that you're vulnerable, but you have more freedom of movement. Anyway, after a while, I guess this hardens again. I didn't see anything in the PR explaining how long it takes for your new exoskeleton to harden back to full force. But anyway, I think that's all the basic information. Molting will occur around every five weeks, which in cataclysm terms is, is quite a long time, so it's not happening all the time. As for my personal opinion, I think this is just such an interesting change. It takes normally static mutations and it adds a dynamic element to them. Yeah, I really like this change. I think it's like really unique and interesting and I would have never thought to add this to the game. So good work. I, I really like this. Next up today from Danissimo, we've got Brigandine Armor. I'm pretty sure that's how you say that. For those that don't know, Brigandine Ar Brig <laughs> that's going to be a problem as I'm recording this segment. For those that don't know, Brigandine Armor is like uh, basically a cloth or leather garment with uh, they have like strips of metal inside instead of a like full forged uh, plate of armor. There are some pictures in the PR. I guess I'll just show them on screen. It's a lot easier than trying to explain it. Now the idea here being that forging plate armor is extremely time consuming both in real life and in Cataclysm uh, to the point that no one mostly makes it in the game. And yes I know some of you post on Discord about how you've made your own plate armor, you know, yeah yeah, but for the majority of us we're never going to make plate mail. Also for the record, I always thought this was called splint armor, this style of armor, but when I looked up brigandine and splint armor, apparently they are different, although I have no idea what the difference is. They both appear to be just metal strips attached to leather or cloth, so, you know, take that however you will. Anyway, you can see why brigandine armor, which is just cloth and metal strips, would be less time consuming and skill intensive when compared to making a full set of plate armor. Alright, but anyway, let's look at the armor now. It's got about a million different versions since it can use the various steel qualities in crafting and it has small and large variants for mutants. I'm just going to use, uh, like I don't know, in the video, medium steel for all the examples that I show. Now the main feature would be the coat, which also has a version that is the coat plus shoulder guards. You can also wear the shoulder guards separately if you don't want them combined into the same garment for some reason. There are also brigandine gloves as well, and the naming convention here is a bit confusing if you were to just search for the term brigandine. The chest piece is referred to as brigandine, as is the coat with the shoulders and the gloves, but the rest of the gear, which are the shoulder guards, knee guards, elbow guards, those are just listed as medium steel arm guards, for example. So these are not explicitly listed as brigandine pieces, so if you're searching the crafting menu, you might have a little bit harder time uh, finding what you're looking for. But anyway, there's a bit too much here for me to review individually, so you're going to have to check them out on your own if you're interested. Most of the garments are relatively quick crafts if you have the proficiencies required, although the coat itself does take a fair bit of time. But again, this is uh, significantly less than plate armor. I mean, I mean, obviously, it's much you know better than plate armor in terms of time cost. Now, the other changes in this PR were related to chainmail pieces, and it looks like their encumbrance was lowered across the board. The PR also says it quote, changed how different chainmail armor pieces combine together, but to be honest, I have no idea what it was like before, so I can't really provide feedback on that. And I'm sure that there's more here that I should be talking about, but I really don't know what to say, so we're just going to move on. Next up is a truly fantastic change from Kamiyana. Now this PR is very long in its descriptions and it changed uh, very many files, so I'm just going to explain it the best I can in my own words describing what I think is the most important aspect of this. Basically, electronic devices can now be plugged directly into power sources. So instead of constantly recharging and swapping batteries, some electronics can be plugged directly into your car or the power grid in your base. So for example, I can take my smartphone and use it to play music. Normally, this would drain its battery and I would later need to drop my phone into a recharging station to recharge the battery if I wanted to use it again. 
Now instead, I can activate the phone, select the plug in option, and then select my car to plug it directly into my car. Now this does require a dashboard or similar electronics, uh, whatever the control panel is called. However, once it's plugged in, my phone will now display as being plugged in when viewed in the inventory. Using the phone in this state will directly drain power from my vehicle rather than from my phone's internal battery. While plugged in, as far as I can tell, this does not recharge the interior battery. It just makes it so that instead of using charges when in use, it will draw power directly from the source rather than that battery. Now in a perfect world, this would probably also charge the device as well, but doing this would remove the need for swappable batteries or recharging stations. When plugged in, you will need to remain near the source of power. When you reach the distance limit on the cable, a message is printed in the log. If you walk further, the cable will then disconnect automatically and you will return to using the internal battery for power. Now this doesn't break it or anything, it just uh, unplugs it, it's not like you're ripping the cord out of the phone. You can also unplug manually by acting activating the item again and selecting that option. Now I probably don't have to tell you why this is uh, just a very handy little feature. Now I don't have a complete list of tools that were affected by this change. Some things make a lot of sense. Most of us plug in our laptops or tablets or phones every single day of our lives, so obviously those make sense. But of course you would not plug a flashlight into a wall socket, for example, so you know it wouldn't be usable on a flashlight. So I don't really know exactly what all was affected here, but you know, obviously just use your common sense. Now really regardless, I like this change quite a lot. It's it's such a great little feature for when you're sitting in your base and you want to use your phone for music, for example. And while it probably only affects a pretty limited number of electronics, it should still be recognized that this is great work. I really like this. And then finally today, uh, yeah, like I said, it's a really short show today. Finally today from Bark, we've got the addition of 195 nation state flags. So I believe he went based on internationally recognized nations, so you know, there are countries in the world that certain other countries don't recognize as actual countries, but the international community does, and blah blah, etc. This was highly inclusive, and should include basically every country that you can think of that currently exists. Now these were added as variants, so you're not going to suddenly find like thousands of flags in the game or anything. There's just one item, and when it spawns, it will choose randomly which flag it actually is. Now I really only mention this because it's like a staggering number of additions, and because, well, Bark is my friend, and I'm all about favoritism. Ultimately, this has little to no gameplay impact, and most tile sets, I mean, they're not going to have tiles for every flag. Now, I do want to say that, well, okay, forgive me, I don't know how to say your name, but I wanted to shout out Procyane for making a whole bunch of sprites related to the new flags. These were for the MSX Zotto tile set, however that's pronounced, man, I can't pronounce anything today. Anyway, it's for the MSX tile set, uh, and they look really great. I think it's really nice that they were making all of these sprites even before the PR was actually merged into the game. Uh, some of the images were floating around on Discord. And with that, I think that's it for the show, everyone. Now, I am going to talk a little bit about why the video was late and uh, why there might be issues for future shows as well. But uh, for all of you who are bailing on the video right now, I'll see you in a couple weeks with another episode. All right, so let's talk about it. So my job recently changed. Now I still work for the same company, but the routes that I drive for work have changed significantly. And for those that don't know, I make deliveries overnight. So like grocery stores, pharmacies, convenience stores, uh, stuff like that. Now I don't say what company I work for because, well, because I hate my company and complain about it and it seems weird to name drop them when I talk so much crap on the company I work for. But anyway, my routes changed, which means I'm working kind of a lot more than I used to. But not only that, the company had also messed up our website that generates our routes and manages our inventory. So I had to do everything manually, and that might not sound bad, but let's put it like this. Last week on Monday and Tuesday for my old route, I probably worked like 10 hours on YouTube and maybe 8 hours for my real job. However, this week on Monday and Tuesday combined, I worked about one hour on YouTube and about 28 hours on my job. And for those who are unfamiliar with basic math, that means that I worked a load more than I usually do, about 14 hours a night. 
So me writing this script, for example, I would normally have finished this on Monday, but this week I'm finishing up on Friday and recording the audio on Friday, which, uh, spoiler alert, that's the day the video is usually finished and going up on the channel. Now, it has been a truly brutal week. Uh, I've worked more hours this week than probably any week that I've worked in the last 15 years, and it was just, it was awful. It was awful, Internet. So anyway, that's why this video is late. However, moving forward, I should start working less hours, especially once our website comes back online and I don't have to manually make my own route and manage inventory and by hand and all the headaches that came along with that. But anyway, hopefully in the next few weeks, I'll be able to return to working like, you know, five or six hours a night, six days a week and, and should be a lot easier. Now, the other major problem moving forward is that my family member on June 12th, which is, it might even be the day that you see this, uh, is having a, a certain surgery. Now she had the first surgery back in January and afterwards it took her about a month before she could even walk up the stairs. So I had to do a lot of things around the house that I normally wouldn't do like cooking, cleaning, laundry, helping them move furniture around, things like that. It's not a big deal, it's just it, it, it's more responsibility. So on the 12th she's having the follow-up surgery and it's expected to have about the same recovery time. Now back in January during the first surgery the show was this show was on hiatus so it didn't really matter if I was doing a bunch of stuff around the house because I didn't have any time restrictions on when I like had a deadline to make a video. But now with her having surgery and me working way more hours uh, the next month or so is probably going to be pretty rough. But anyway, that's a long way of saying, hey everybody, please bear with me as I struggle through the next month uh, and try to get uh, videos out on schedule. I'll be doing my best to go back to my routine and try to keep these videos on the uh, every other week on Friday schedule that I've had for like four years now. And additionally, I have been working on another Cataclysm series that was supposed to go up this week, but it's been postponed because of how much, uh, how bad my work has been. I'm going to try to upload that this next week. I already recorded three episodes like a month ago. So, you know, I don't know. Hopefully we can get that thing going. I miss having more Cataclysm content on the channel. I know you guys miss that as well. Right, anyway, that took a long time to explain. Everyone, as always, thank you for watching. Uh, thank you for your understanding and, you know, I don't know. So yeah, thanks for being here and I'll see you in a couple of weeks with our next episode.